Hello everyone. In the last lecture, we ended with the image of Shiva Nataraja, and Shiva Nataraja that we see here in this Chola context to be performing this Ananda Tandava dance. And in this particular image, we also see that there is this superb use of bronze. And this bronze casting, something that uh, we see here, this is the same process of locks, a uh, lost wax process that was there in the Harappan times. So, um, that small image of a dancing woman that we have studied in the Harappan context, it followed a similar kind of uh, technical, um, you know, aspect that we see them to be uh, much more, uh, you know, sophisticatedly, uh, you know, utilized in the image of Shiva Nataraja here in the 10th and 11th century. So, this is also something that we can think about that how this knowledge of bronze casting that we have studied in the um, earlier uh, context, in the Harappan context, in the Indus Valley context. So, those knowledges were actually not lost, but perhaps there had been pockets in the Indian subcontinent where those knowledge were nurtured and then it had its manifestation in the Chola court and in part of um, in the, uh, you know, in the in the Kaveri Delta. So, the town of Swami Malai even today in uh, that is near Tanjavur, they practice this uh, art of making or the craft of making this bronze icons. Now, in terms of this bronze icons, we see not only Shiva Nataraja and as I have already mentioned that I mean these images were not really placed in the Garva Griha, but they were meant for uh, the processions, they were meant for being taken out to the public on chariot and so on. And that is the reason we find the holes in the, in the pedestal of these images through which threads were passed on and then they were uh, attached to bamboo poles and things like that and then they were carried on the shoulder of the people. So, that is the reason we find this, this particular characteristic feature is very important in all this show, most of this Chola bronzes. Now, ap apart from the image of Shiva Nataraja, except for the Garva Griha or the womb chamber of the Shiva temple at Chidambaram that is also there in the Kaveri, um, uh, that is also there by the, um, in, in the Kaveri Delta region, which is very close to the Bay of Bengal. Uh, they only, that is the place where we find, uh, where um, a bronze icon of Shiva Nataraja is placed in the, in the sanctum. Apart from that, mostly in the temples, we find that there are abstracted representation of Shiva in form of a lingam that is placed in the Garvagriha and the, this Utsava Murtis or this ceremonial uh, bronze figures, they are placed uh, side uh, in the sides or like I mean in the other chambers and um, they are only taken out during the, this particular occasions. Now, apart from this, uh, this particular uh, representation of Shiva as Shiva Nataraja, we also see the image of Ardhanarishwara that made uh, its impact uh, here. So, one of the images that we have here that is from uh, the Chola dynasty and that there in the government museum Chennai and this is one of the fine examples of how the idea of Ardhanarishwara that came into uh, you know that, that manifested in this Chola bronzes. So, we have touched upon this uh, theme when we were looking into the cave temple of uh, Elephanta and where there is a, um, there is a face of uh, Parvati or Vamadeva and then how Shiva's different aspects they sort of came together. And here in this bronze icon what we have that half of the body is of Shiva, this part of the body where there are two hands and then he also holds an axe which is also part of the South Indian iconography of Shiva. And this part of the body belongs to a goddess Parvati and that is how we see that in one part of the body there is a breast. But the other part of the body um, th there is not and then this part of the body there is this lower flowy garment which is also um, a well known kind of uh, iconographical trait 
for the goddesses and the women in these bronzes whereas here we only see that for Shiva there is a loincloth kind of um, you know uh, or a short dhoti like garment which which is also associated with Shiva being an ascetic. So these are the different aspects that we find they have played out and uh, so those are the ways in which we find how the iconography and the complexity of temple building they were side by side and they went together with the technological explorations in terms of making bronze and also all the other kind of exploration in terms of giving this super balance. For example, how this tri body bent here that also uh, is utilized superbly with one of the hands raised outside and then here how that is balanced with only one hand these two hands and here one hand. So all these different aspects we find that artists take iconographical uh, religious aspects and many and the technological aspects all of them they come together in this bronze icons like them. Now from there we also find that how there have been uh, very different, I mean very important um, uh, patrons of, of the temples. For example, we see the, uh, the figure of Sembian Mahadevi in, in the Chola context and uh, uh, she was active in the late 10th century and early 11th century. So uh, we see that I mean how the, the women patrons also were, uh, you know, they, they had their important roles in terms of patronizing the temples as well as their contribution to the administrative uh, um, you know aspects of the of the state as well as like I mean running the entire state and so on. So these are some of the things we find and then we also see that how this uh, idea of the gender and then uh, if a temple is dedicated to a goddess as opposed to a god how that also made a huge deal of impact in terms of the way in which architecture is perceived. So there is a example and now from Tamil Nadu we are moving back to the northern and central India. Now here is another example from the city of Bhubaneswar and as I have said that in Bhubaneswar there have been many different kind of temple building activities during this time. So between 7th century to 12th century there have been many phases in which different temples were built. And this is a temple, this is a called Vaitala temple or Vaitala Deol and this is a temple that we find that is called, it has three spires or this is called the Tin Mundia temple and Tin Mundia temple that basically means that it does not have one Mundi or a Shikhara but there are Tin Mundi or like three Shikharas. So for example this, this, this. So we see three Amalaka stones in instead of one and then three Kalashas on the top of them. So this is a unique kind of temple that we find that um, this is not really common in most of the places. So even though we have seen this barrel roof kind of structure but that was not really uh, you know there usually for the Shikara of the temple. And also there was not really three Amalaka stones on the top of them. So in those ways we certainly find this temple to be very different from many other temples that we have studied and the reason for that is that this particular temple Vaitala temple is dedicated to uh, the goddess the supreme goddess and her three manifestations. So since there are three manifestations of the goddess they are enshrined in this temple so that's the reason they have three Amalaka stones on the top of it. So basically instead of one axis mandi one can imagine that there are three axis mandi which is running uh, vertically and then by those axis axis mandis there are the images of the goddesses in the garbhagriha or in the womb chamber right. So that is these are some of the contextual uh, aspects in which we find that how uh, even though there were some of the uh, uniform rules for making the temples uh, and you know as we also uh, make a distinction between what is south Indian temple what is north Indian temple but these are some of the ways in which we also find that this specific context that if a temple is dedicated to these three goddesses how the architecture is also treated very different from the ones where only one prime god or goddesses go goddess is placed. So these are some of the examples that also tell us that how the treaties on architecture they have also changed with uh, depending on for whom these are built and all these different aspects. 
From there we also find that there are some of the uh, these temples which are dedicated to not one or two uh, figures, but 64 figures and that is something we find that is there in the yogini temples and the yogini temples are there in uh, different parts of um, eastern and central India. So, for example, we have one of the celebrated yogini temple in Hirapur in, uh, in Odisha and that particular site is not just known for uh, their practices related to tantrism in Hinduism, but also for Vajrayana tantric practices in Buddhism. So, what we find in the temple of Hirapur that in the instead of like I mean uh, you know in the in this temple complex we have this this circular kind of orientation that is there in the uh, inner part of the temple and then there are 64 cells and 64 cells will have like each of the cells will have one image of the yoginis. The yoginis are the ones who have assisted the great goddess during various wars and they are also been considered to be they, they are the knowledgeable ones. So, in one hand they are the valiant ones, they are the brave ones, but they are also the knowledgeable ones and that is the reason we find that they hold high significance in the tantric practices as well as in the practices where the power of the great goddess uh, is celebrated. So, for that also we find to, to enshrine the 64 goddesses or the demi goddesses, the temple was also built in particular way. So, in this temple in Hirapur, we have like or all these cells which have the images of this uh, yoginis, they, they sort of surround this entire interior of this temple complex and uh, it is it's all it is very much an open air temple instead of like I mean having a uh, overarching roof on the top of the entire place. We see there is only a small shrine in the center of this uh, you know in the in the center of this temple which is which has a roof, but apart from that it is a it is an open air temple and that shrine is dedicated to Lord Shiva and Lord Shiva is also someone who has been associated with the tantric practices. Now, from moving from there, we also find that there are temples for example, and this temple in Hirapur uh, in Orissa that comes from 9th century. So, apart after that we find that there are some of the other temples in uh, central India and parts of eastern India and so on, where this kind of strategy has been uh, utilized. And this is one of the one of the sites for example, here we have this particular uh, site where um, in, in Morena in, in Madhya Pradesh where this Chosa Yogini temple was built in the 11th century. And if you see the structure of it, this how there is this uh, open air temple like structure and then um, you know that there is a central shrine, but then there are all those cells or those all those smaller shrines which sort of encircle the central one and then uh, the rest of the area of the temple is empty making it almost like a courtyard with this um, covered cells around it. So, for its circular orientation, this is also something that people have suggested how this particular temple site which has 64 cells and for that reason it had the necessity to be in this circular fashion that also made an impact on making the Indian parliament in the 20th century. So, circle being uh, you know uh, relevant in geometry which is one of the most stable shapes on the earth and uh, that is the reason we also find that how that was utilized in talking about state administration for making the parliament building. However, here we find the circular shape actually had a very different kind of purpose to serve and that is to that is to enshrine all those 64 goddesses or the demi goddesses in this one uh, particular this site. So, from there we if we go little further and this is perhaps the, uh, the, the final stage of temple building that we find in central and northern India and uh, here 
we we are here uh, in this image at the at the site of Khajuraho again in Madhya Pradesh and uh, in Khajuraho we find the temple building activities they were patronized by the Chandela rulers and the Chandela rulers we find them to be active in this site of Khajuraho between 10th and 11th centuries and during this time period we find around 23 temples were built so in Khajuraho in this site there are those groups of temples the western group the eastern group the southern group and so on and so in this areas we find both um, uh, you know Hindu Jain temples are there and also these are the temples that we have there in these 23 temples and uh, the Jain temples they also have similarities with the uh, Hindu temples however um, they in cases we have found that I mean uh, the Jain temples also have certain uh, differences from the Hindu temples since we are focusing on the uh, Hindu temples for this module so I will be looking into little uh, of the details those we find in this final stage of Hindu temple architecture in the uh, 11th century. So, this is here one of the examples that we have on screen in the left side uh, and that is Kandariya Mahadev temple and this is of course a temple that is dedicated to Lord Shiva and here what we find that I mean the temple it does not just stands as a metaphor of the uh, Mount Meru or Mount Kailasha, but it actually rises as this mountain. So, it it has this high ambition of almost turning into a mountain. So, this mountain metaphor we have see here it almost like materialized it is actualized by making this temple. So, apart from that what are the aspects of this what are the um, you know different parts of the temple if we see it. So, we I will start from this beginning. So, this is the area through which the visitors can or, or the devotees can enter the temple complex and here we see the, there is this entrance porch this is a small area and this is the area which is called Ardha Mandapa. So, Ardha Mandapa is of course, as we can imagine that I mean this is not a full Mandapa, but this is just um, you know uh, the Ardha Mandapa through which one can just approach the temple. And uh, another important part is that we see the temple is situated on a high platform and much higher from the ones we have seen in, in Patadakal or in Bhubaneswar and so on. So, this high platform or Jagati that also uh, you know that also announces its divine presence and how this temple is uh, not part of our mundane life, but this is this is on an elevated plane. So, then on the top of that I mean when we see the Ardha Mandapa from Ardha Mandapa one can go inside and then the, there is the Mandapa. So, Mandapa is also this another squarish uh, you know space in which that that is also uh, utilized for people to gather there or take shelter and we also see that how these temples they are not totally covered but there are areas here for example we can see how the pillars and then there is open space for air and uh, you know light to pass through these places because this temples the shikhara or like I mean the structure the superstructure of the temple is so heavy so that's the reason to to allow light and air within this uh, you know within this structure this kind of openings are very much uh, part of the of them as uh, also like I mean thinking about the comfort and usability of these temples. So, from there we find there is this Mahamandapa. So, Mahamandapa is basically this large ceremonial halls from so first from Ardha Mandapa and if we can see it here like I mean how there are those stairways and from there we have this Ardha Mandapa here and from there there is the Mandapa and Mandapa gets like slightly larger than Ardha Mandapa and from there we have this Mahamandapa which is much more larger it is a pillared hall and then the Mahamandapa also has projections in both the sides. So, these are the areas where we have the projections. So, these projections are also the places through which it allows light and air through this uh, you know into the structures or else as you can see that apart from this openings there are no other ways through which light and air can be allowed inside the temple complexes. And then 
in this Ardha Mandapa Mahamandapa then we have this small area which is the vestibule or Antarala or Antarala is the place which sort of like I mean after the space expands like if there is Ardha Mandapa this is small then there is Mandapa that gets slightly bigger in size and then there is Mahamandapa that is much bigger than the Mandapa and then there is a small passage so then suddenly the space sort of squeezes and something that we have already discussed in the earlier context that I mean how the mandapas are made as the ceremonial halls but it's not necessary for all the devotees to sort of like I mean go through the ceremonial hall to the Garvagriha and that is the reason there is a small a narrow pathway only to allow selected people to the Garvagriha and then there is the Garvagriha which is here that we find. Now in this, uh, this plan we also find that within the temple structure uh, there is this inner circumambulatory path. So the inner circumambulatory path is not just there in the outer area but there is also something that is within the temple, something we have also seen in the context of the Raja Rajeshwara temple in Tanjavur. So those things as I have said that I mean with time the temple building had become more and more complex. So those things we find them to be uh, you know utilized in, the, in this structure. Now if these are the complexity in the ground plan then what we see there in the outer side of the temple there are many of these vertical projections for example here, here and then the, this replication of the shikhara or the superstructure like for example this ones we see that I mean how they add to the central shikhara they support the central shikhara but at the same time it almost looks like that I mean how um, uh, the central shikhara has manifested itself into this smaller uh, shikharas around it. So this is again this idea of the multiplication that we have already discussed in the Hindu context how the universe um, you know each element that replicates and multiplies and that is how the entire universe is formed and all the complexity and everything that is that comes into existence. And as we have already said that how this uh, particular idea of all the multiplication everything that also comes together in the form of a temple how everything uh, comes back to the creator. So those are the ideas that we find to be relevant in this temple here as well and as I and also this uh, the symbolism of the Mount Meru or the Mount Kailasha that also comes alive in the way in which the tower rises on the top of this uh, Garvagriha. And usually we find that the, the tower that is there on the top of the Garvagriha is the, high, is the, the tallest one. So from there we will see the final stage of architecture in Orissa and that is uh, that will be the temple which is called the Konar temple and it was built around uh, 13th century by the Eastern Ganga dynasty rulers and it is uh, very close to the Bay of Bengal and uh, we see that I mean uh, this entire temple did not really survive. So there are you know the, we, we can see that only certain part of the temple that had survived and uh, as a um, you know in, in terms of its context what we find the entire temple was built as a chariot. So this is a temple Konark temple that is uh, dedicated to the sun god and that is the reason the way in which um, in Hindu mythology how uh, the sun god is considered to ride his uh, chariot or driven by seven horses and that is the reason we find the entire temple was conceptualized as a chariot and around the temple we also find in this high platforms there are those wheels, the wheels of time and also the wheels which uh, symbolically run the temple. So this is the wheel of time in which like I mean the Braharas as like the hours the way we understand like the division of time every day those Praharas are depicted in the spokes of the wheel. And, um, and, and then we also have um, you know one of the one of the uh, you know the stairways 
towards uh, you know of, of this mahamandapa or the jagmohan the way that is um, called in the uh, in the odisan architectural terms that had the stairway and by the stairway there were those seven horses they were depicted so this symbolism of the sun god and the horse the horse driven chariot that came alive in this massive this uh, lofty monumental architectural uh, complex and in this complex we find that there have been uh, reconstruction of this the reconstruction of the plan and everything else because the entire temple did not survive and so this is the site which is called the jagamohana or uh, you know the mahamandapa and at the back side of it there must have been this uh, shikhara now why we consider this particular uh, you know this temple which is now existing that why this is not the garbhagriha because if we follow the architecture very closely we know that this is not the uh, superstructure that is used for garbhagriha so the uh, the garbhagriha with this with curvilinear uh, and uh, you know the shikhara which rises tall that is very different from this pyramidal roof that we find here in this mahamandapa if we compare that to like i mean this mandapa here as well so this also follows this pyramidal kind of um, you know the planning which resembles the one that we see here in konark right so that is how we can imagine that this particular part was not really the garbhagriha or the main sanctum sanctorum but it was the mahamandapa which was adjoined to the to this temple so these are the ways in which we find that by um, you know in uh, until 13th century there's different ways in which the temple building activities they took place in the uh, and how the idea of the hindu temple was um, you know was was practiced by the artisans the sculptors the architects in the different parts of the indian subcontinent so from starting from the very beginning if we think that i mean how some of the simpler rock shelters and the cave temples they start they they were perceived as those womb chambers this dark chamber where creation starts where all of our lives start so from there if we think about it then how the complexity of the um, you know the universe that came in to be in this this temple complexes so those are the ideas we find that i mean how from a very small um, you know unit it starts and then like it manifests into the most uh, complex um you know a most complex uh, entity that one can think about so this these are the, this is the range that we find that that is been covered in the hindu temples and that is also something we have already stressed in the beginning of this lecture that how this this things do not really talk about that particular one way of life or one way of being but it is multiplicity through which like i mean um this this ideas the art practices and the hindu philosophy that thrive thank you